In the life of man, the supersensible and the physical worlds are in constant interplay. And I have already mentioned extreme cases in which both worlds, or indeed all three worlds, cooperate without man, by means of his own development, doing anything to bring it about. We shall today discuss some examples of this intermingling of the different worlds. And to begin with, I intend to speak of some types of ordinary sleepwalkers, or moon wanderers, then of types of men of the Jakob Burma order, and finally of the Swedenborg type. These three types are so related to one another that each one can be regarded as indicating, by means of a cosmic experiment, the connection of the evolution of humanity with that of the cosmos. I want to draw your attention to this. When we consider these three types, as they pass to and fro from the spiritual world, with a certain disregard of the guardian, we find that each one perceives the supersensible world in a different way. The activity of the sleepwalker, for instance, is not the same in the spiritual world as though it proceeded from imaginative, inspirational or intuitive cognition. This is because when one goes into that world, as everyone does, unconsciously, whenever he goes to sleep, one finds everything different from what it is here in the physical world. I have already mentioned this. There are, above all, three properties in the supersensible world which are utterly opposed to any belonging to the physical world. They differ so completely as regards all that a man is accustomed to consider true, right, and healthy, that it is not possible for one holding the present earthly ideas concerning the soul and body to be transported straightway into that world. That is why I so strongly emphasized in my books on initiation the necessity for the right preparation before entering the spiritual world. Everything is there described in such a way that if a man follows the instructions given, he will in every respect be prepared to enter the supersensible world in the right way. But the three types of which I am about to speak have not been thus prepared. Rather have they been guided to the spiritual world by their destiny. And this karma safeguards them from danger of any kind. Indeed, through this karma of theirs, mankind as a whole is made acquainted with certain things which can otherwise only be known through imaginative, inspirational and intuitive cognition. In the first place, there is no such thing as gravitation in the spiritual supersensible world. When in that world, really within it, we are not in the ponderable, but in the imponderable. The first experience, in quotes, a man has when he enters that world in full consciousness is that of feeling the ground give way beneath his feet, and he feels he can only remain in any given place through an inner strength of his own. You must therefore picture this feeling, which must indubitably come to one who really wants to enter the spiritual world, as resembling what you would feel here in the physical world if a demon pulled away the ground from beneath your feet, and you were no longer subject to the law of gravitation, but were free in cosmic space, maintaining yourself therein by your own strength. The second experience in the supersensible world is the cessation of what we know here in the physical world as sense perception. To put it briefly, we may say that light ceases and we are plunged in darkness. This, of course, is but a limited way of putting it, for the blind, too, have this experience here on earth, though they still have the other sense perceptions. Science, in dealing with the spirit, often puts under the heading of light that which is both light and color, that which is both audible and perceptible to the sense of touch, and that which is perceived as a sense of warmth. All this is non-existent in the supersensible world. And we can simply give an indication of what this implies by using an expression indicative of a sense experience familiar to most people. It is getting dark. The light is going. The third experience in the spiritual world, for which we must develop a feeling of energy, is that of finding a void instead of fullness. 
Here in the sense world we have everywhere objects which we can touch. If we touch nothing we still have the air in which we dwell. Everywhere is fullness. In the spiritual world instead of fullness there is everywhere emptiness, void. Thus we can say here in the physical sense world rules the ponderable, that which in a physical sense is luminous as are all our sense impressions, and we also have fullness but in the spiritual world rules the imponderable, the darkness, which we must ourselves enlighten with the light developed within us as we evolve, and the emptiness which we must ourselves fill with the living essence that we absorb when through initiation we transport ourselves into other spiritual beings and thus fill the void as regards our higher consciousness. When his instinctive destiny drives a man from the region of ponderable substances in which rule the laws of gravitation into that ruled by the imponderable, forces outside the earth take possession of him. When man walks about on the earth, as also when he lies down, he is always subject to the laws of gravitation, but if for a few moments he is lifted out of this sphere, he encounters a counter-thrust, an opposing force to that of gravitation. He becomes aware of a force within him which draws him away from the earth instead of fastening him down to it. This proceeds from the reflected light of the moon. Thus here on earth man walks about and in his normal life is subject to the forces of attraction of the earth. When he walks about on earth in his normal life he is subject to the earth's gravitation. He is held firmly to the earth. If through his karma, which is then connected with the nature forces holding sway within him, the earth's gravitation at certain brief periods of his life withdraws from him, the moon forces then begin to work as opposing forces, as anti-gravitation. When these begin to work in a man, he then begins to walk in his sleep. He is then subject to the forces which hold sway in his physical and etheric bodies and are related to those forces which are not only reflected in the light of the moon but are also reflected in company with many other forces also coming from the moon to the earth. These forces attract man. They continually try to tear him away from the earth. And at such times as he comes into the sphere of influence of the anti-gravitation influences of the moon working in opposition to the earth forces, he may become a sleepwalker, a somnambulist. The forces then ruling in man are very different from the normal earth forces. This, however, only applies to the humanity of the present day. These forces, which are now abnormal and which you can only observe in the somnambulist, were quite normal at other epochs of the earth's development. If you call a sleepwalker by his earthly name when he is walking on the roof under the influence of the moon forces, because at other epochs of the earth men were not given names in the way they are given today, nor a like kind of name, he falls at once back into the region of the earth forces. Thus one is able to perceive the real facts of the case. One sees the normal man of today and realizes that in him rule what unites man with the earth forces of today. As soon, however, as a man enters the sphere of the moon evolution, he behaves as though he were actually living in the astral world and no longer on earth in the physical sphere. Only the astral mingles with the physical. It makes use of his physical body. What thus presents the astral in a physical way was once upon a time moon evolution. What still reminds us, in the physical, of that astral activity was once upon a time a world evolution, the moon evolution, and will someday exist again. Then, however, man will be able in full consciousness to walk steadily on crooked surfaces, just as the flies can walk up vertical walls. It points to what will come about in the future, to the Jupiter evolution. Thus, if we understand the sleepwalker aright, we can study in the physical image thus presented to us, as though nature herself showed us by means of an example, what we ourselves went through during the moon existence, though not of course clothed in physical but in an infinitely finer substance, 
and what we shall experience again when, in a future evolution, the Jupiter evolution, we shall have learned in full and clear consciousness to be masters of our physical substance. The sleepwalker points both to the to a past and a future cosmic development. In this connection we are referring to those who may be called moon men. Those these are those who at certain moments of their lives may become sleepwalkers. Now if what the sleeper does during his night wanderings, moving about without regard to gravitation and the imponderable, is carried out spiritually in full consciousness, retaining at the same time the power of keeping quite still, we may say that whereas the sleepwalker obeys the stimulus of the moon forces and surrenders unconsciously to these, carrying out every movement to which he is impelled, the student who enters in conscious exact clairvoyance can hold each one of such movements back and not move at all. Through being able to control every impulse to movement, carrying none of them out, they become transformed into intuitions. Thus conscious intuition, the highest development of exact clairvoyance, consists in withholding what a man who obeys his instincts must carry out in sleepwalking, because he gives way to these forces and cannot help following them entirely. The man who transmutes them does not obey the physical moon forces, but holds them back within himself, and thereby attains a corresponding devotion to the spiritual. He attains intuition. It is therefore really a very good plan, on the one hand, to study the relation of man to the evolution of the cosmos by studying these moon men, and on the other to study those who are, I might say, exactly the opposite of the sleepwalkers, the exact clairvoyants. Thus, if the sleepwalkers, the moon seekers, are instinctive, the exact clairvoyant, intuitive seers are those who are able to attain quietude and are firm in their resistance to the moon powers. That is what is disclosed to us at this point concerning the relation of man to the cosmos. The second of the types I am describing today is that of Jakob Burma. His whole nature was so constituted that at certain moments of his life, by reason of a natural destiny or karma, he could have before him, in a complete state of wakefulness, instead of the sunlit world, the darkness of space. From what I have already said, you will understand that this not only refers to darkness in contradistinction to light, but also to the negation of all the powers of the senses. During certain states of his life, Jakob Burma might have before him darkness instead of light silence, stillness instead of world-creative tones, and instead of warmth, immunity to warmth, or indeed cold, what might be called anti-warmth. When these states to which Jakob Bermo was subject at certain moments of his life, without himself realizing them as such, are investigated from the spiritual side through inspiration, we find that at such times, instead of sun-illumined space, he was faced with absolute darkness. Men who are subject to these conditions, of which they are not conscious, and in which they still feel themselves to be living in the sun-illumined world, while they are really in in a light sleep, possess what is known as second sight. Jakob Burma possessed a very high degree of second sight, but this was so developed in him that he did not make use of it so much for earthly things as for an investigation into the constitution of the whole earth. What then was his view of the world? Where other people see the sunlight, Jakob Burma had no external feeling at the point where the visual rays cross when we focus our sight on a distant object or one near at hand. Nor had he any external feeling behind the point where we place the right hand over the left but he then felt the intervention of his own self so that it acted like a wall. He had before him the darkness, the negation of the senses. You must form a clear concept of what this implies. There is something in the physical world which absolutely corresponds with this. If you look into a mirror, you do not see what is behind it, 
you only see what is in front of it. The same thing holds good spiritually for one who has the vision of Jacob Burma. What he sees before him is spiritual because the darkness behind it acts as the mirror in which he sees the reflection of the spiritual background. He sees the earth world reflected in its spirituality. If you belonged to the Jacob Burma type, you would at certain moments of your life look into the darkness. And because you not only looked into it, but also it reflected back the spirituality that lives in the earth life, you would be thus enabled to see the spiritual constitutions of the earth and what goes on in it. Jacob Berman possessed very powerful second sight. Another person might, at certain moments of his life, see the darkness before him, concealing the physical life, and thus have an opportunity of looking into the spiritual. If he knew how to make the right use of this mirror reflection, which consists solely of the existence of darkness, he might, through the inner communications which exist between all earthly things, be able to perceive the actions or even the thoughts of a friend in America while he himself was in Europe. For what we perceive with physical eyes and physical senses is due to the activity of the sun, but there are also concealed sun workings. These latter live in all things, in minerals, plants and animals, and even in man. While you yourself are in Europe, you are in communication with your friend in America through these concealed sun workings, which he too experiences. <clears throat> these communications have an effect on a person's karma. Many a man has been led by destiny to meet someone with whom he was not formally acquainted, and who was at a certain time in America and the meeting resulted in either friendship, love, or marriage. The concealed sun activities affect the karmic effects on earth. It can here be seen as though in a mirror. This is especially the case with people who live a sec secluded life on an island or in a valley or other such favorable regions. Second sight is very frequently to be encountered in such places because persons living a more or less secluded existence can more easily attain inner communion and thereby partially spread the desired darkness around them. Hence the Scotch second sight, the Westphalian second sight, and so on, and the second sight so beautifully described by Oberlin from his secluded rocky valley in Alsace. Such phenomena appear more especially in particular regions of the earth, it is much more difficult than is usually supposed to form an opinion about the realities which play a part in the earth, for if they are indeed true realities, such as those just referred to, they are the concealed sun activities. In the present materialistic age, certain people who think themselves very clever in so doing question whether there ever was a King Arthur, whether he was not a mythical, per mythical per personage. Now one who can really look into the matter will speak in a very different way. To him these learned men who doubt the existence of King Arthur are much more legendary than King Arthur himself, notwithstanding the fact that they live in our own time. <clears throat> Thus men possessed of this second sight, as was Jacob Burma to a very high degree, are in particular sun men. They are inwardly permeated by the sun force. The concealed sun forces work in and through them, whereas other men perceive in a sense the workings of the sun externally, in the external world. Just as the first belong to the type of the moon, so these latter, the Jacob Burma men, are sun men, who, through their own natural karma, have within them a faculty which is abnormal in our day, but which nevertheless expresses realities. What we today consider abnormal was absolutely normal when times were different. So, when we realize that what men possessed of second sight can see, and what the concealed sun forces are with which they are permeated, we finally admit that their life and the concealed sun activities, which, is, which to us today seems abnormal, was once upon a time in earlier periods of the Earth's evolution the normal everyday life 
and that it will some day be so again. <laughs> it was the normal life during the sun evolution of the earth which preceded the earth evolution proper. It was then the normal state for men to look into the darkness around as into a mirror and to see therein everything spiritual radiating back to them. The whole earth passed through that evolution which possessed the forces which made man in his then light fluidic substance a sun man that occurred in a lowered, very much lowered state of consciousness. The day will come when this will return. Man will then be able in full waking consciousness to radiate darkness into his environment and in so doing will obtain a reflected picture of the whole cosmos. We then enter that stage of evolution which I may designate as the Venus evolution which is a future stage of evolution of our earth. If a man wishes to attain this second sight he must get rid of his coarse sense nature, his lower sensibility, the rude sense for the physical in his environment, and draw forth from within himself his free sensibility. This can be done in a quite inward way, although the process is not devoid of danger. It can be done in the following way, though I am not advising anyone to do it. By fixing the attention on a shining object one can become fascinated, this to some extent cripples external sensibility and the inner nature comes more into evidence. The result may be what second sight supervenes. Excuse me, let me read that again. The result may be that second sight supervenes. In olden times this second sight was in, cir in certain circumstances systematically called forth. Stories dealing with this calling forth of second sight tell of a magical mirror. Magical mirrors were instruments for producing fascination, for dimming external sensation, thereby calling forth inner sensation in its stead. By means of the instrumentality of the physical mirror, spiritual reflection was brought about. The point in question was not what could be seen in the physical mirror, for that only dimmed outer sensation. Inner sensation was aroused by this magical mirror. Thus the belief arose that in the magical mirror itself were to be seen the thoughts and feelings of absent friends, while in reality one only saw into oneself through the sun conditions brought about by the external physical mirror. One who has this perception sees absolute realities. He sees the spiritual processes taking place in the kingdoms of nature, and he himself thus becomes, in a sense, united with everything of a sun nature on earth. The writings of Jacob Berma must be considered from this aspect. If they are to be really understood, we must realize that their whole content is the result of a complicated and wonderful second sight. Paracelsus was another personality organized in a similar, though somewhat different way. He brought a stronger intellect to bear upon what he sensed. Hence he always interpreted the pictures that arose through his second sight. Now when a man ponders intellectually over physical things, he does not alter them. The intellect is powerless to alter the constitution of physical sense things. But in the case of what presents itself in the mirror reflections just described, it is by no means powerless. None but a personality such as Jacob Burma, able to devote himself quite selflessly to the study of external things, can perceive with pure second sight the inner constitution of the world. In Jacob Burma there dwelt infinite love, in the light of which he saw all things, and which permeated his comprehension of the reflected image of the spiritual in the world. This infinite love speaks in almost every line written by him, and so the reflected images which presented the spiritual in the universe in imaginations, so to speak, were for the most part preserved intact. In Paracelsus, who possessed a powerful intellect, 
these pictures were subject to a corresponding alteration through his intellectualism. They were mirror pictures, but transformed. Even physical reflections can transform what they reflect, as you can convince yourself by seeing your own face reflected in a distorting mirror. You would certainly not like to resemble the face you see in those mirrors. In like manner, if a man's intellect is of the caliber of that of Paracelsus, his intellectualism will alter the reflection through which he looks, but he cannot by this means enter further into the inner forces. Hence Jacob Burma, with his very highly developed capacity for love and for observation of things, became a contemplative observer, while Paracelsus, whose study was more turned to the inner forces and who distorted the reflected images and carried them about with him, Paracelsus turned more to the healing forces, the sun forces, which are concealed in things. Again, if a student can learn consciously to dominate the concealed sun forces dwelling in man, so that the darkness spread out around him is not made use of for seeing reflected pictures, but rather for enkindling the inner light through meditation and concentration and so forth in his soul and spirit, so that the illumined space usually filled with light from the external physical sun can now be filled with the inner concealed sun forces, and that he himself becomes a light in soul and spirit and can throw light on what is present, there arises in him conscious imagination. This it is which can then call up in full consciousness, such as that to which we are accustomed in our ordinary cognition, that which Jacob Burma, being a sun man, inscribed in his writings, more or less unconsciously, but with rather less mastery of the world of ideas. Thus, just as the secret moon forces ruling in man are more or less connected with intuition, just as from these forces, if firmly retained, which a man develops as he goes about the world, there will arise the forces of intuition, so the reflected images, conjured out of the spiritual darkness by the concealed sun forces, can be transformed into conscious imaginations. If the reflected images are taken up, and instead of gazing at them and allowing oneself to be affected by them, one looks through them, if second sight is dealt with in this reverse way, then arise conscious imaginations. The somnambulist type lives in the moon forces, the Jacob Burma type in the sun forces. But there is a third type that lives in the relations of heat and cold, constantly present in space in the vicinity of the earth, in the wider environment of the earth. Man, in his normal life, is accustomed to be ruled by the temperature, but there is a certain fine inner sensibility which is less dependent on the effects of external heat and cold. It is more sensitive, very sensitive indeed, to the effects of the concealed heat and cold which pass through cosmic space. Swedenborg, at a certain time of his life, attained the capacity of being sensitive to the concealed workings of heat and cold, which work in space external to those ordinary physical ones which make us suffer from heat or shiver with cold. When we try to penetrate the mysterious life of Swedenborg, it becomes more and more evident that this sensibility to the conditions of heat and cold in cosmic space around the earth arose in him at a definite age, as the result of his having been till that time a first-rate scientist in the official science of his day. The works of Swedenborg, which concern official knowledge, are very numerous. They were all made public at the same time, and indeed there is at the present day a society of learned Swedes who are desirous of publishing in many volumes the purely scientific works left by Swedenborg. But they are confronted with great difficulties, they are forced to admit that in these gifted works he proved himself to be one of the most gifted personalities of his day. Yet, at a certain time in his life, he became clairvoyant. 
which according to his which according to the view of those desirous of officially publishing his works means idiotic and crazy. We shall today occupy ourselves more with what Swedenborg developed as a higher vision after having acquired all the recognized knowledge of his day. We must go more closely into the nature of what caused official science to consider him idiotic. We discover, on investigating the personality of Swedenborg, that he became, in quotes, idiotic through having developed in his fortieth year an intense and overwhelming love for the knowledge he had till then acquired. Swedenborg, more than any man in the world, learned to love knowledge for its own sake. It was this love of knowledge which led him, at a certain point of his life, to be able to investigate the spiritual world according to his own methods, to make himself sensitive to the conditions of the concealed heat and cold of the universe. These hidden conditions of heat and cold in cosmic space come not from the moon, nor yet from the sun. They come principally from a star which in reality shines but mildly in cosmic space. They come from Saturn. The peculiarly modest radiance of Saturn in the planetary cosmic space around our Earth yields those hidden forces by which Swedenborg, at a definite period of his life, was permeated. By means of these he became specially sensitive to the void, in contradistinction to the fullness everywhere around us in the world of sense. One day a sensitivity to the void arose within him, but it arose from instinct. He had not sought it. He had been through no such development as I have described in knowledge of the higher worlds and how to attain it. It arose within him as a finer, higher instinct. Thus he saw into that world which we can only see when we can penetrate what flows through cosmic space as the conditions of heat and cold. In other words, the radiations of Saturn. Parenthesis, in quotes, seeing does not here refer to physical vision. Close parenthesis. His vision was thereby of a peculiar nature. When we read what Swedenborg presented as the results of this vision of his, they almost seem to be etherealized, refined, earthly experiences. The spirits he perceived, angels, archangels, etc., certainly move freely about, free from ponderability, but they move quite as earth beings move. We might ask, was it a real world that he saw? Or was it a projection of his own fullness into the void? Neither one nor the other, but something quite different. You know that besides the world which man can perceive with his physical senses, and the second, the etheric world, besides these two world spheres, or territories of the universe, there is another, a purely spiritual world, in which spiritual beings who have never descended to earth move livingly, and in which they are livingly active. Now these beings active in the purely spiritual world must intervene in the life on earth. They must, therefore, communicate what they do in the purely spiritual world to the etheric part of the earth. Let us imagine the earth surrounded by and permeated by its own ether. A world of spiritual active beings projects into the earthly sphere. The earth only is what it is because of the activity of these active spiritual beings. This activity radiates into the earthly sphere and radiates back again and is released into the earth ether. These forces of the earth ether are in fact etheric realizations of the spiritual realities above them. When we observe the earth ether around us, we find it full of the activity of spiritual beings, but in etheric pictures the actual activity is above or within it. What immediately surrounds the earth is the activity projected first into the earth and then back from the earth into the earth ether. It is just as though the mirror pictures did not remain mere pictures but began to develop an activity of their own. 
the spiritual activity really rayed back from the earth to the ether is to be found therein. Let me read that again. The spiritual activity really rayed back from the earth to the ether is to be found therein. It is a real projection of spiritual activity. Just as Jakob Burma saw what takes place in the human body or in nature reflected in the manner described, so to Swedenborg the earth was a mirror reflecting the pictures of the spiritual activity in the ether of the earthly world. It is therefore quite as easy to say that nothing that Swedenborg saw was in the spiritual world as to say that is the spiritual world. It is just a realized mirror picture, the mirror being the earth itself, herself. It is true, but it is simply the true reflection of that reality which is outside the beholder. That is what Swedenborg saw. He perceived in the earth ether the manner in which the supersensible beings develop forces therein, forces which subsequently play a part in the life of man and otherwise in earth life. These etheric forces, which are neither angels nor archangels, but forces vibrating in the ether, play a part in the earth life and the life of man. It is today considered abnormal to be able to see into these concealed earth forces which throw an etheric image of the original archetypes of the spirit into the surrounding ether. There was, however, a period in the evolution of the earth, that period which preceded the sun period and may be described as the Saturn period, when it was known in the consciousness, then normal, that at some future time man would experience the Venus period, and that, when the Venus period had come and gone, the Vulcan period would set in. The knowledge of the conditions then prevailing on earth, as revealed to the humanity of that time, and as it will again be revealed in the Vulcan period, that knowledge came to Swedenborg as a special vision. Now when a man becomes able consciously to penetrate what Swedenborg saw as pictures in the ether, when he is able to replace with his own fullness the void in cosmic space, the beings seen etherically by Swedenborg then vanish from exact clairvoyance, they disappear from etheric sight, but they become audible to spiritual hearing, to the spiritual ear. When they as visionary images are blotted out, they then begin to be inspirations, inspiring one's consciousness in audible sounds from the spiritual world. So that we may say, what in Swedenborg was imagination, because it arose in etheric images, unconscious imaginations, will, if we carefully observe the warning of the guardian of the threshold, as he was not able to do, be translated from the etheric imagination to astral inspiration which can arise in man in full consciousness. Thus I have described how both the more subconscious condition of sleepwalking, the Jakob Verma type and the Swedenborg type are related to what can be consciously acquired by means of intuition, imagination and inspiration. This sequence is necessarily different because I have been describing from the side of the cosmos. If we adhere not only to names but rather to the things themselves, we must, if we wish to describe them from various points of view, change the order of sequences in which they stand, just as sometimes we have to alter our own perspective. For instance, if two men are standing here and I step between them, I have one before me and the other behind, but if I stand behind them, both are in front of me. In like manner, things in cosmic space are in different positions, according to the points of view which we must take.